a little bit different. And I think that's important to, to realize that and then be willing to go that, that extra mile to unravel and, and, and unlayer what we need to. Right. And again, we are keeping all three of these components balanced, but for our topic tonight, we are really going to zone in on this relationships component. All right, so when we're talking about balancing relationships, Joshua and I kind of broke these down into three separate categories and we're going to rapid fire go through this because we really want to get to your questions and make sure that we have enough time for that at the end. So we are going to speed through this, but if you have some clarification questions or something doesn't really make sense, again, make sure that you reach out to Trish or to us a little bit later and we can help clarify. So the first component in a relationship, of course, is our relationship with ourself. And that is reflecting on our physical health, our mental and our emotional health, and then our spiritual health. And really being intentional about keeping those things balanced within our own personal interpersonal relationship. So some of the struggles that we see, and this is not going to be a comprehensive list. These are just some things that we've either experienced as struggles in our own life or things that people have shared with us that, that they identify as being a personal kind of struggle. So some people struggle with guilt or blame, maybe having a lack of an ability to forgive themselves. Sometimes people admit that they've got a lack of confidence or they're feeling inadequate, like they're not really up to the challenge or up to the job or up to the tough things that have been thrown at them. Sometimes people struggle with fear and worry. And a really common one, especially in the field of agriculture, farming and ranching is the time management piece. How do we manage our time when we don't ever really get to clock out? And just sometimes we, we work from sun up to sundown and we don't always have the best handle on managing our time when so many things um, influence how we spend our time that are kind of beyond our control. Anything you wanna add? All right, so then we've got our family or our team. And we know that when we're talking about the agriculture related businesses, farming, ranching, oftentimes it's a family business where there's multi-generations, but we know that's not always the case. And we know that that's, it's not limited to a family type business. So we're just going to kind of use broad terms like a family or a team when you're, when you're working within your family team relationship. And some of the struggles that we see quite commonly, when a team or a family lacks vision or lacks context, people in within the relationship can really be pulling in different directions. And even if you're off a little bit in a lack of shared vision, it, it can pull people and family members off just enough to make it off balance. And then there's more extreme cases where people are so far off because they don't have a clear understood vision amongst the group that they really can be kind of pulling in opposite directions. And so we see a lot of conflict come from here. We see probably one of the biggest, biggest barriers and things that cause struggles would be barriers in communication. And we'll dive a little bit deeper into that as we go on, but communication we think is huge. We need to be able to communicate effectively so that we can be heard and we can be understood. And so we can hear others and we can understand others. And so uh, oftentimes we don't spend enough time, I think, focusing on the listening piece. And so some of the things that we work with with people is how do we become better listeners so that we can hear other people and understand what they're really what they're really needing and what they're really wanting. We have confusion of roles. Sometimes uh, roles on a ranch or farm or an agricultural business, sometimes we don't have those as defined as, as they should be. Who's doing what and, and when? Sometimes there's some confusion there. And along with that, sometimes we see a lack of autonomy where there's maybe one person in the operation that is maybe micromanaging the circumstances and, and not giving the other team members some autonomy to do it his own way or her own way. And that can cause conflict. Another thing is sometimes people have a, a lack of understanding of what their purpose is. So they want to be helpful. They want to participate within the family or team, but they don't necessarily know how. 
And then there's a lack of training that can cause conflict. That's just maybe people do know what they want to do or they're interested in something, but they're just not fully trained or capable to do it at this point. And the last one we have on this list for now, again, the not a comprehensive list, just some things that are quite common from our experience is multi-generational hangups. When we have a multi-generational farmer ranch and there's miscommunication and, a, and sometimes conflict in a relationship between one generation and the next. So sometimes we see, you know, the maybe the younger generation is waiting for the older generation to step aside. And maybe the older generation is waiting for the younger generation to step up. So just some confusion there. Um, this is one that comes up quite a quite a bit. Sometimes I think we are really quick to criticize and point out what family and team members are not doing. And, and we don't always take the time to show true appreciation. And this is something that if there's one small thing that you want to do to try to improve your relationships, it's speak gratitude over your family members. Tell them what you are thankful for and tell them what you appreciate. What do they bring to the table that you appreciate? Big and small things. Sometimes just appreciating the smallest things can really make a big impact. Yep. There's just one thing I was going to add to that, and that is you know, it, it, it seems um, our judgment or our recognition of problems can sometimes, uh, or things that we don't like or things that aren't going the way that we want can be easy to identify. Uh, but if we get so far off track with that, uh, it, it really starts to derail the, the whole family, the whole team, the whole business. And most of the things that, that we have run into either personally or with the, uh, the businesses and families that we've that we've worked with or, or even learned from, it comes back to something contained in one of these particular uh, items, uh, especially when we're dealing with, with a, a family. And these are things because it's family and probably ultimately because it's agriculture, which has a lot of uniqueness to it. Uh, we don't always apply the same rules of thumb that other businesses might apply and have found a lot of success in applying. And it's one of the reasons why oftentimes if we run into a problem, we may go to mentors, we may go to others that have been through it, but oftentimes we'll also go to resources that are non-agricultural simply because they will have a view on something that might seem very simple to them, uh, seems fairly complex with the roles that, that we tend to play and with the businesses that we're involved with. I agree. And then the last category that we've broken this down into would be balancing the relationships that would include your neighbors or your community. And some of the struggles that we hear of here is the peer pressure or the perceived peer pressure that people think that they have to do something a certain way because it's acceptable within the community or they should or shouldn't do something because of how they perceive that it'll affect their neighbor. Gossip, you know, oftentimes um, assumptions can be made and and it, it might be true and it might not, but when we engage in gossiping about community members or about neighbors, as you can imagine, a lot of problems can arise just because of that. The competition, sometimes it's people perceive that, that there is competition in, in one person doing something a certain way versus another and accept it. The reason we added acceptance to this list is it's honestly a, a, a bit of a, a two way street, you know, acceptance can be a, a positive thing from the standpoint that that we can accept other people and that they might operate their farms and ranches differently, their enterprises might be differently, how they they time things during the year, all of those things um, can be uh, things that we accept that they're going to hopefully make the best decisions for them and we respect that and then hopefully they can also respect that we're going to try and make the best decisions for our own family and our own operation. But where we run into trouble with acceptance has to do when something happens just real gradually, just little bit by little bit. And if it's in the wrong direction, we don't necessarily always recognize it or it's got to get pretty bad. 
uh, before we say, how did that happen? Where did that come from? Uh, how, how did we not see this? Well, when it happens in really small increments, we don't notice it until it's bad enough to where it really catches our attention. So the acceptance piece, whether that's uh, accepting soil erosion and degradation, or whether that's uh, a financial situation that's slowly degrading, or, or probably worst of them all, a, a social or relationship type situation that's degrading, uh, it's one of those things that if that if we can recognize early, and, and there's some other symptoms that might come with that, uh, we have a much better chance of of steering that back on track and, and getting moving in the right direction. Okay, now before we go any further, we have mentioned this before, but the reason that we named our ranch what we did was after this Matthew six thirty three Bible verse. So this is something that has become very, very meaningful to us, this Bible verse and the naming of our ranch, because we personally have found that in our relationship struggles, we do much better when we give it to God and when we seek him first and when we get into the Bible and we, we read the words and we are encouraged and we're uplifted. This is not because we have all the answers, but because we work to serve a God who does have all the answers. Now, I know that not everybody has the same kind of relationship with Jesus that we do. If that is something that you are interested in learning more about, connect with us afterward and we will help get you connected. But this is something that's really become pivotal in our focus for the way that we manage our ranch is working to put God first and working to really ask questions and, and put things in perspective and help us seek solutions rather than just whine and complain about our problems. Okay, so that being said, as we navigate these tough things that we're about to talk about, we believe, our personal belief is that it's less about having the right answers and it's more about asking the right questions. And we'll give some examples of how we navigate that. And for us, ultimately, we have learned how to submit to God's will. We've had challenges in our own life and in uh, things seemed like they were going to break us, I think, at the time. And learning to submit to God's will really helped us shift our perspective and move in a direction that we really desired to go. I think asking the right questions is really the only way that we can ultimately get to the right answers for our given situation. Oftentimes, uh, and, and, and maybe other people have, many have had this experience as well, but when you just keep jumping from to the next answer, the next answer, the next answer, hoping that the next one is going to be the right one and that it will make all the difference in the world for any given situation, we, we run the risk of not exploring the things that we needed to explore, not opening the doors that we needed to, to open by asking questions. And so the power for us and in, in, in our experience has been uh, asking questions or, or helping others try and ask questions. And it's not that we have all the right questions, but just simply that willingness to, to seek and, and keep seeking, ask and keep asking, uh, eventually uh, starts to lead us down a, a path that maybe we didn't even see to begin with. And quite honestly, the, the risk in asking the wrong question is far less than jumping on what we think is the right answer uh, if we don't have all the background and, and didn't ask the right questions in the first place. Yeah, and I think ultimately it's just given us a lot of peace and it's allowed us to be very humble we know that taking care of God's creation and caring for the land, for the soil, for animals, for our family members, it's a really, really complex thing. And so we really have felt a, a lot of peace and a lot of humbleness in being able to do it. Okay, so what questions should we be asking? These are just our suggestions. Of course, you're gonna come up with some of your own questions, but if you're not really sure where to go, this might hopefully get you kind of on the, on the, right, on the right track or take some of the first steps. So a question I really like to ask myself is if I'm finding that there's something that is unbalanced or that I want to complain about maybe or am, am experiencing frustration or some kind of negative feeling, about my circumstance. A good question that I really like to start with is, is this exactly how I want it right now? 
And I will notice that there are some things in my everyday life, maybe it's daily chores that maybe aren't your favorite and they never end. But ultimately my answer to this question, if I'm really being honest, sometimes the answer to this question is yes. I don't love to necessarily do the dishes or there's some chores that you might be doing on the, your ranch that you might not necessarily love to do, but is it exactly how you want it right now? Maybe the answer is yes, because it means that you are called to do something greater. If you're washing dishes, you're, you're thankful that you have a family to feed and you have food to feed, which gives you the need to wash dishes. If you've got, you know, outside chores, it's because you're feeding animals and you're choosing that kind of lifestyle. So sometimes even though you don't like it, you can kind of just give yourself some peace of mind knowing that, yes, this is exactly how I want it right now. I've chosen this, but there's also plenty of times when the answer to this question is no. This is not how I want it right now. And so then if, if our answer to this question is no, I don't want it this way right now, then we need to ask ourselves, well, what am I willing to do about it? Because whining and complaining and, and pandering and that's not going to serve anything. It's not going to help. So the, the next step after you identify, no, this isn't how I want it. The next question that I recommend asking is this, and this is going to require a really honest answer. Am I interested in making a change? If I don't like something, how it's, how it's going right now, if I don't like it, it, if I don't like it, how it is right now, am I interested in making a change or am I committed to making a change? And they're completely different. There are some things that I'm interested in doing, but I'm not committed. And it's only the things that we decide to be committed to that we will actually be able to change. So if you're navigating a difficult relationship or you're struggling with some kind of tough thing and you recognize that you want to make a change, first, you need to ask yourself, am I just interested? Would it be nice if there was a change or am I committed to making a change happen? I think it's really, it's, it's, it's a really, this is like the fork in the road in the, in the decision-making process. This is, this is where you either say, well, that would be nice, but I am not going to put in the effort, the energy or the commitment to it. And that's kind of the end of it. Or if you're committed, that's the point where, where you set the stake in the ground. And from that point forward, you, you are committed to, to doing this. And I think it's a, a real interesting question to ask at this stage because if you're only interested, well, then you can just shift gears and do something else. If you're committed, uh, then you you have you have made that decision for yourself. Maybe even communicated it to others that are around you. Uh, but now you are you're going to move forward, and that's really important. Now we have a whole bunch of other questions that we are going to share with you. But before we move on, I really want to just go back to the slide that was previous to this and really have this sink in. So again, think of a situation right now that you're navigating that's a tough thing. Ask yourself, is this exactly how I want it right now? And if your answer is no, then ask yourself if you're interested in making a change or if you're actually going to put in the time energy and work that it takes to be committed to it okay now the next questions these some of these will apply to your situation and some of them may not apply but we're just going to kind of again quickly go through some of these and you can reflect more deeply on the ones that you see fit so am i focusing my time and energy on what i do want or what i don't want and again, be really honest with your answers. Am I in charge of my emotions or are my emotions in charge of me? And a follow-up question to that is, am I reacting logically or emotionally? I think we notice that in our society, things have become so emotionally based. And from the time that I've spent reading on some of the brain research literature, when we are thinking, when we're feeling things emotionally, it works a totally different part of the brain in a different way than when we're thinking about things logically and rationally. And when we're, when we're interjecting emotions onto things, it can really kind of cloud some of that. So we're not saying shove your feelings and emotions under the rug. We're saying if there is 
something that you're dealing with and there's a lot of emotion behind it, we tend to suggest that you work on the emotion first as needed process that emotion in a healthy way. And if you need help, reach out for help. And we can give you some suggestions and some examples if you wanna connect with us, because we really like to connect people to helpful resources. So work on the emotions, but then once you're ready to be in a logical state, then tackle that problem. Wait until you're able to think logically and critically. Oftentimes too, I think this is why people have an easier time helping people navigate Um, other people's problems. When somebody asks for advice or asks for help, oftentimes the person who's not emotionally tied to that has an easier time giving some suggestions because they can see it from a different perspective. Do you have anything? Okay. Am I taking responsibility for my behaviors or do I tend to blame others or make excuses? So if you find that when you're complaining about things, maybe if you're constantly blaming someone else, I think it would do us all some good if we really reflected on, okay, what part of that is, is my responsibility and am I taking responsibility for my behaviors and what good does it do to just blame others or make excuses? Now there's always a reason for something there's a reason why something happened or a reason why something didn't go the way that we had hoped or the way that we anticipated, but a reason for something happening and making excuses is not necessarily not typically the same thing. So being really reflective and humbling ourselves to be honest with that question. The next one, am I gathering information directly from the source or am I making an assumption or gossiping? Okay, and we touched on gossiping earlier. It does not tend to be helpful whatsoever. In fact, as we all know, that can be really harmful. And assumptions, this is one of the biggest things that we tend to, um, it's a major topic that we tend to talk about in some of our holistic management courses because we make assumptions all the time. Our brain likes to fill in the blanks. If we don't have all the pieces of something, our brain's just gonna kind of automatically fill that in but we can get ourselves into trouble. And this is one of the biggest communication barriers is when, for example, if I just assume Joshua's thinking something and I don't actually ask him, or I assume that he meant one thing by what he said, but I didn't ask to, for clarification, I can run with an assumption that oftentimes isn't correct or isn't completely correct. And we can make assumptions on a lot of people's behalf. And when we're working with families, when you're talking about a spouse, when you have kids, maybe parents, friends, neighbors, if we just assume they're thinking something without actually asking them, that can get us into a lot of trouble. So we really encourage people to say things like, would you clarify what you meant by that? I think you were saying such and such, but I'm not sure that I understood you correctly. And people really like to have an opportunity, I think, to be able to say, I really appreciate that you're taking the time to hear what I have to say. So oftentimes people will gladly clarify what what it is that there might be some confusion on. One of the other things with the assumption piece, and, and this is something that we can do kind of within ourselves as well, is if we make assumptions about how much something's going to cost or how much something or how long it's going to take uh, or or that sort of thing, we, we, can, we can make some incorrect uh, decisions, if you will. For example, uh, in, in the past, there's times where as, as a family uh, here on, on this ranch, we'll say, well, we have to do this job ourselves because my gosh, do you know what it's going to cost to have someone else come in and do that piece of the project? And this past summer, we had a couple of those where we honestly took a step back and asked each other, well, how much is it going to cost? And nobody knew. And so without that piece of information, we were just running with an assumption that we had to do darn near everything because we assumed it was just going to cost too much for someone else to do. And, and it's, it's a whole nother thing to explore in terms of value and who should do it and who should not and that sort of thing. But when we make assumptions, it's just dangerous all the way around. And yes, do we have to fill in some voids so we don't just end up stuck you know, 800 times a day? Yes, I'm sure that we do. Uh, but we need to be careful how quickly we're doing it and who we're doing it on behalf of. I agree. And some of us, if you are the kind of person who struggles with some guilt or blame, 
do you truly understand that it is okay to make mistakes and work to correct them? We all make mistakes. And sometimes they're financial errors, sometimes they're biological errors, and sometimes we mess up with our relationships. And we all are going to make mistakes. I think the important thing is knowing that you can forgive yourself for them and you can forgive other people for their mistakes and work to correct them. Am I leading, managing, or micromanaging? That's a topic that I, that I often, well, I've struggled with this personally. Um, and I've been in a number of situations where at different times, uh, any of these might be appropriate. Um, with, with our kids, there are some times where a little bit of micromanagement on a brand new topic or a brand new uh, project or something uh, might be the case. And yet there's other times where some sincere autonomy might be appropriate. There's also the idea that, that you know, we can manage and we can manage and we can manage, uh, meaning we can be moving the cows and we can be, you know, having the right genetics and we can be practicing good grazing management. We can do all those things, but if we don't have the leadership component out front of that to pull all these pieces together, oftentimes we can manage something to death and it, and it doesn't do us any good because there wasn't the leadership component to be out in front. So asking just the question, is this a scenario where I need to be leading? or I need to be managing, or, or maybe am I actually micromanaging and don't need to? The second one then says, am I being effective or am I just being efficient with my time and resources? Uh, for anybody who's ever had a to-do list, which I suspect that most everybody has, uh, maybe, maybe multiple to-do lists or a to-do list that never quite completely gets everything crossed off of it. And so then it just continues from one day to the next, one week to the next. And the whole idea, well, if I could just get more done, if I could just get more things done in a day, just get more things done in a week. Well, if you could actually get more things done in a week and you did get more efficient, what do you do with your extra time? Do you spend it on the things that you really would like to, or does it just get filled up with the next thing and the next urgency and the next fire that needs to be put out and those sorts of things? So the whole idea that taking a step back and trying to ask yourself, am I actually being effective or am I just doing a lot of things Yes, I might be getting them done quickly, but am I doing the right things? And then the last question on this one here, it says, just because I can do it, should I do it? Okay, just because this is something I can put on my list, should it actually go on my list? Or is there someone else that I can offer this opportunity to? Is there someone else that I can pay to do it? Is there someone else or, or some other business or company or, or, or do I even need to do it at all? Maybe, maybe that's the question that needs to be asked. But just because we can do it and we tend to be pretty self-sufficient people in agriculture, a lot of times we will just take it on. And that can at some point get overwhelming because there's too many things that yes, we could do them. We are capable of doing them. We have the skills, the abilities, or, or we have the drive to learn how to do it if we don't know how to do it currently doesn't necessarily mean we should do it. So I think that question becomes important. The next one I've, that, that we listed on here is, is this whole idea. And I know that some people, uh, we probably all know some people who like a good debate and are willing to argue and argue and argue uh, as, as much as, I mean, that, that's just something they really like to do. And then we also know people on the other end of the spectrum that they will just avoid conflict at all costs and they will not engage. And guess what? The opinions of both of those people are important because they're opinions of those people. Now, we may disagree, but the second part of that is this idea that we can disagree and do so respectfully. That's actually a good thing. And so do we know how to respectfully disagree with someone's opinion, meaning that we're not afraid to ask for it in the first place, simply because we think, well, I'm not going to even ask because I know we're not going to agree. Well, then we haven't developed the skills or the processing skills in conversation to be able to do that. And then the next one says, do I have the conviction to share my own opinion respectfully? Your opinion matters. And you might be the only one in the world that actually thinks that, but you're not going to know unless you actually offer it. And because your opinion matters, our opinion with conviction without being arrogant, without being judgmental and continue on this path of, of being respectful. And then, and then the last one, am I able to separate person from behavior, knowing that a person's worth is not necessarily tied up in how they acted one particular time or how they uh, 
acted or words that they said in one particular uh, situation or scenario. And therefore, can we actually separate the person uh, from the behavior? And that's been a huge item for us in terms of being able to process what happened in, in a given scenario or a given situation in the past. And then the last one that we added here, go back on, please, um, is, is where am I drawing my fuel and my strength? And I think uh, mm. what that says to me or what I'm trying to communicate through this particular statement is, well, years ago, I'll just give you a personal example. Years and years ago, uh, my tank was fueled up when I got positive feedback from people. The downside to that is what happens when I got negative feedback. It also drains your tank. And quite honestly, you can have 10 people fill up your tank if you were Josh Ducart, and you can have one person cause it to drain. And that one person could do just as much damage as those 10 people did good. And so this whole idea that if, that if you rely on other people to fuel you, and then you also let them, uh, you know, even if it's unintentional, take you back down, then your strength becomes this roller coaster and your ability to ride through these situations. And we all know there's challenging situations, especially in agriculture, that if that's how we decide whether we're successful or not, or whether we have value or not is relying on other people, we're setting ourselves up into a pretty risky situation. And it wasn't until uh, Tara and I started viewing things more from the standpoint. We had mentors to help us with this, but realizing that our self-worth came from our value in, in God's eyes, uh, not so much in other people's eyes, and therefore that's where our strength came from. Now, does that mean that we don't need supporting people around us? If that's not the case at all. We need people like that. We need groups. We need support. We need feed and that that feed criticism or it might come back as you know something real positive but that we can use both and that we are stronger because of it that's why we like to ask this particular question and, and this one's a little bit of a deep one and it's a it's a very personal personal one and and maybe causes us to be a bit vulnerable uh but honestly if we can work our way through these questions that we've just talked about and others that that we didn't put on this list it gives us a better chance that we've asked the right questions Okay, so before we get to the questions that have come in from you, this is kind of a recap for us, a little bit of a summary. So for us in navigating the tough stuff, we choose to pray for divine influence. Again, we don't have all the answers, but we work to serve a God who does. And so that divine influence has been incredibly huge for us. So we also want to ask and keep asking. We want to ask questions and keep digging deeper, going deeper and deeper until we find the root cause of the problem. And a lot of the questions that we just talked about, hopefully that can trigger some things for you that kind of help getting you moved in the right direction so that you can get to your root cause of what you're navigating. We want to use critical thinking skills. There's a lot of things that are happening, I think, in current events that um, just doesn't seem to make sense. So just with everything that you're doing, really think critically. And a big part of thinking critically is making sure that you're not letting emotion bleed into a situation where you should be able to think logically. So being able to separate logic from emotions, deal with your emotions in a very healthy way, and then go back to that critical thinking skills and look at things logically and definitely bring in some outside help to help you look at it from, from somebody else's perspective. The next one, differentiate leadership from management. Uh, to be honest with you, I actually, I think I brought this up in our very first one uh, that we had back in, in February. Uh, but this actually came from a friend of ours by the name of James Rogers. Uh, he's the, the, the former manager for the Wine Cup Gamble Ranch in, in Nevada. And, and he gave a podcast where he talked about the, the difference between management and leadership and how he believed that we've gotten to a point on most places anyway, that management is not the weak link. The, the management is there. The understanding of, of grazing tools and, and of livestock. Um, and although there's plenty more to learn about soils and, and that sort of thing, uh, the basic management items are there. 
what management needs in order to get it off the ground and moving in the right direction is leadership. And in what I'm talking about there is, is the decision making uh, that comes from deciding which management and when in order to adapt to a particular place. And, it, and it, it's probably a little bit more complex than this, but one of the things that we talk about with our kids is, is just their, um, they need to think for themselves, but then they also need to own the benefits or the consequences that come from those decisions. And I think oftentimes we might lose that very simple uh, approach. Uh, I, I know there's days when I do uh, lose that simple view or, or approach on decision making is that if we truly want the benefits uh, and the empowerment from our decisions, uh, we can have that. But we're also going to have some consequences and some mistakes along the way. But as Tara pointed out, uh, we can work to correct those. Leadership is what spots those. Leadership is what corrects those. Management's what we actually do on a day-to-day -day basis. And the last one, seek alternative options. Don't be afraid to try something new. Again, sometimes it might work and sometimes it might not, but seek alternative options. Find some people who can help you. Reach out to great resources like the Grazing Lands Coalition and some mentors there. Just try something new. If what you're doing isn't working and you're committed to making a change. Try some new things. Okay. I think we'll we'll pop this up, but Trish, if you want to ask some of the questions that you have. We'll, we'll certainly do our best to answer as many questions as, as we can get to. Uh, and, and of course, uh, uh, answer them as, we, as best we can, given our circumstances, knowing that we haven't necessarily experienced all of what you might have on your minds. Um, but uh, fire away, Trish. Okay. Um, the first question that I have that came in was, how do I, as a young person that wants to come back to the farmer ranch, convince the older generation that I can't do things the same way that they did to make a living? <clears throat> well, I, I would say that that's, that's honestly pretty common. Uh, that's, that's not something that's out in, in left field. And the whole idea there in, in one of the approaches that we that we took um, with with this one is well Tara brought it up earlier when we talked about gratitude first of all we need to lay a foundation of understanding that what the previous generation did was not um, they did what they were were fit to do what they saw was fit to do and I think there's a lot of respect that should go towards them making it through their generation and building what they built. And so the idea that it shouldn't start with what you're going to do different, it should start with what you really appreciate and respect about what they did first. And that might even go back more than one generation. That might go back a couple generations. You know, if you think about what some of the previous generations did and some of the big changes uh, that they made, and some of the risks that they took, um, there's a lot, I think, to be appreciative of that. But if you can build that type of relationship and that kind of respect, offering that kind of, of gratitude and appreciation, I think that, and, and do it genuinely, not, 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 just, not just with uh, lip service, but, but genuinely, then all of a sudden the conversation, I think, can eventually roll into, here are some ideas that I have. Ask their opinion about what they think about those ideas, but be ready to support uh, what you want to do and why, why you think it's important. And I think one of the things that could enter into that conversation that could be beneficial is talking about how just because I want to do something different, and Tara and I have, have gone through this part of it, there are some things that we wanted to change and, and thought we very much needed to change on this particular place. It was not because my parents or my grandparents did it wrong. It's because there have been some things that have changed, whether it's markets or the landscape or, or input costs or, or what skills and interests and passions we have versus what the previous generation had or what we see as opportunities. All of those things come into play. But I think before we just jump into that, we, we need to really touch on what value is already there and has been built Otherwise, we would might not even have this opportunity uh, in the first place. Okay, thank you. 
Um, another one that we had come in is we are a conventional ag operation and I, as the ranch wife, am completely stressed out. I don't want my husband to know, so I keep it to myself. Um, I don't know what to do or who to go to. What would you suggest? You know, what I've really noticed, um, my background is professionally is in education. And I just naturally was really interested in health. And so early in my career, when I would attend a lot of workshops, I attended a lot of health workshops and education workshops. And I found that the health workshops were primarily women. And meanwhile, Joshua was going to agricultural workshops. And I perceived then, if you would agree, that it was mostly men. Mostly, not, mostly, not all, not, but not, mostly. Definitely. Mo but the majority was men. And I have seen, and some of you can, maybe you've seen something different, but I have found that every time, like as the years go on, the agricultural community meetings, I mean, the events that the Grazing Lands Coalition puts on and different county events and seminars, there are so many more women. And I think that that's phenomenal that, that women are becoming so much more involved in agriculture. And, and I think to a certain extent, women always have been, but there's more women showing up to these things. So just getting connected in these kinds of mentoring network groups, I think it's wonderful for women to connect with other women and couples to connect with other couples and families to connect with other families. And there's going to be some commonalities and there's definitely going to be some differences, but I think the commonalities can, can be great because you have something obviously in common that you can discuss, but where there's differences, you know, you can pick someone else's brain, somebody who's looking at something from an outside perspective. But I just think, I mean, definitely get connected with the Grazing Lands Coalition. You can get connected with us and we'll put you in touch with, with some other women and some other family families that have navigated some similar paths. And maybe they're just a few steps you know, beyond, um, and can, can give some advice. So I think, yeah, I mean, get connected. You're not alone in that. Definitely not alone. I know when, when we first moved to the ranch, I struggled with, with what my place was and, um, yeah, it was, it was great for me to have my own mentors. And so, yeah, I guess that's, I would say, reach out, find, find some mentorship and know that you're not alone in that. Okay, thank you. Um, another question. I'm trying to get set up to take over my parents' operation. My dad keeps undermining what I do. What would you recommend? <laughs> I'll tackle that one. Um, you know, th th this is something, speaking at workshops and teaching schools, th th this is another one that's, that's pretty common. And it comes from the standpoint that that like you just mentioned in the question, someone's trying to try trying to do something new. It might even be small scale, uh, but because something has been done a certain way for for a certain length of time, and and in many cases has seen success seen success doing it that other way, uh, the way it's been done for some time. Uh, you, I can't really fault that person for saying, "Hey, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna continue to do it this way and not let you fail," but there's some danger in that as well. All of us that have probably farm and ranch know that we've made some mistakes along the way. And that's one of the valuable things on, on our place that we've been given permission to do uh, is make some mistakes because my parents believe that that's one of the best ways that, that we actually learn. But one kind of nugget in there that, that I wanted to share is that uh, similarly, when I first would, would come back, and this is before we moved to the ranch, but I would share ideas about, or I would talk about what I think we should do. And I honestly approached it that way. I said, well, I think we should do this, and I think we should do this, and I think this looks bad, or I think this could be better. Or... And although I didn't get a tremendous amount of pushback, there also was no action taken to actually do anything about it. It kind of was this debate, and then it just kind of ended. And so what we did is I started asking, in this case, I asked my father, I said, I'm going to a soil health workshop, I'm going to a grazing workshop, I'm going to a, a, a stockmanship or animal handling workshop, would you come with me? 
And I started with the types of events that are like an afternoon or, or it might be go in the morning and you're home by evening. So it's not like, hey, would you come to a seven day school with me? It was, hey, can, can you come to um, just, just to an event? I would like to know what you think. I would like to be able to discuss it with you afterwards. Would you come with me? And in most cases, yeah, they, they would come with. I know in some circumstances that takes more convincing, uh, but I think we need to work on, hey, I really do value your opinion. If I could get your opinion, but the best way to get your opinion is if you hear the same things I do, then we can actually discuss it, you know, person to person. And it, can I, just to add to that, I think if you perceive that they are, that in this case, the older generation is going to disagree, you could even say, you know what, your dad, you're probably not going to like what they're going to discuss here. Would you come along with me to this and tell me all the reasons why it's not going to work on our place? And sometimes that's enough. It, it kind of depends on what motivates that person. But if that is something that would motivate that person, well, okay, I'm going to go there because I'm going to prove them wrong. They at least get there and it's not the sun or the daughters and it's whoever this is it's it's not their job to convince they just have to get their dad there or whoever it is and then that they know that they can have like full autonomy to be able to critique it and say all the reasons why it doesn't work but you know oftentimes when they hear things from someone else presented in a different way they might be open to try it it was simply one of those things that when when he was hearing it from his own son or, or, or in your scenario, you're hearing it from, you know, that nephew or that niece or the grandson or granddaughter, wh whatever the situation is, you're less likely in most family situations and why this is exactly, I don't know, uh, maybe it doesn't have to be, but in most of those situations, you're maybe more hesitant. But if you hear it from one of your peers, someone who's maybe in the same age range or maybe same stage of career uh, or someone who's, yeah, I've been doing this for 15 years. Here's what I've seen. And especially when they can hear someone say, hey, here's where I, I messed up. Here's where it didn't work. Here was the mistake, but this is what we did about it. And here's where we're at now. And here's the successes that we've had in that process. Then they really get connected in with the story, with the examples. And on the way home, then you don't have to defend anything to your, your father or your mother or whoever it is, I honestly think the best thing you can do is just ask them questions and ask them, what did you think about this? I heard this. What do you think that means? Those sorts of things. Let someone else do the, the uh, information transfer, do the educating, uh, crack things open for you that way, rather than you thinking you have to do it all by yourself. And if they do buy in, refrain from saying, I told you so. <laughs> Yeah, that's probably very true. I know one thing too, uh, and I'm, I'm not sure if it was on one of our munch on this sessions, but this kind of stuck with me is that a lot of times when the older generation has a hard time letting go of the way they're doing it or being approached to change things is because they still have ownership in the operation and they still have risk involved. And once they're the ones that no longer have the risk, then that fear of change goes away because that risk is now on your plate and not their plate anymore. And there's a lot of truth to that. If, if they're the one that's holding the debt and you're wanting to make changes as the newbie coming onto the operation, that scares them. And it's, it's a fear. So it, that really kind of set with me when somebody said that I was like, you know, I hadn't really thought about that before, but if, if they're the one that's holding that debt, then it would be, you know, a, an alarm to them, I guess. Well, and oftentimes they've experiences, experienced some stretches in their career that were pretty defining in terms of where they were at financially, where they were at, you know, maybe biologically. And in most cases, I think the older generation, I mean, they want the younger generation to step up and to work hard and those sorts of things. And yet, most parents don't want their kids to have to go through maybe some of the extreme things that they went through. And so there's a little bit of protection that I think they, they're, they're facilitating in that process as well. Uh, but I think, I think there can, you can meet in the middle on, on, on quite a few of those things, but it's going to take a little bit of a process. Yeah. And again, I just want to reiterate, I think, 
you know, oftentimes you have an entrepreneur who's trying to hand something down to another entrepreneur. And when you've got strong personalities like that, I think really, really start with genuine gratitude. I wanted to clarify that when we're talking about gratitude, it needs to be genuine. It's people see through flattery. Yeah. False flattery. Right. So it, you need to really find things that you really appreciate and that you really respect and don't be afraid to say it. I think those are the things that sometimes we just don't take the time to do, you know, how much we appreciate other people in our lives and what they've done before us and the struggles that they've gone through. Just having those things acknowledged can really, really hold a lot of credibility. A lot of times it's something that we think, but we just don't speak it. And, and we need to make sure that we speak it. Um, speaking about youth, uh, the next question pertains to that. Um, we need to keep youth involved in agriculture. How do I encourage my kids to become part of our operation when I know that they've seen our struggles? Yeah. Um, I'll start with that one anyway. You know, one, one of the, and, and again, it's not that, that we have it all right, but I, when I was a kid, I, I saw my parents' struggles. And, and of course, the younger I was, the less I understood the magnitude, but it doesn't take a, a child to be very old to be able to recognize facial expressions and when someone's under stress or when someone's upset or distant or whatever it is. And I can remember seeing those things. And of course, now I hear, or, or in years past, I've heard the stories of what exactly happened during those times. And I actually very much appreciate when the struggles got shared with me because the unknown was far worse and the hiding was far worse. Now, keep in mind that depending on the age of the child or the young adult or whatever it is, there may be some things uh, that need to be kind of, it needs to be appropriate. Shared obviously. without being burdensome. Yes. And I think that's that's a good way to put it. You know, we, we want to, to share so we know the reality of it. But then I also think that it's important that we model how we handle it. As, as, as parents or as the older generation, how, how did we handle that? How are we processing this? When things got really tough, how are, 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 are we flipping out? Are we just losing it? Or, or are we finding the right resources, taking a step back and, and doing what we need to do in order to, to do that? And that can actually develop some pretty, um, pretty resilient uh, people uh, by being able to do that. Uh, in other cases where I've seen the, the scenario where decision making and uh, all of the stress and all of the adversity was trying was hidden as best they could, well, they didn't hide it as well as they thought they hid it. And that actually was far worse uh, than if they would have been more more open about it. And so I think that that as uh, um, no farmer ranch is perfect. And, and I made the mistake, honestly, the, before we ever moved to the ranch, uh, when I was thinking, boy, I wonder if I could get my wife interested in ever being a part of a, a ranching scenario. I tried to sugarcoat things and I tried to only show the good stuff. And I did that and half the time it backfired on me. And, and then, I had to, then I had to play catch up trying to explain something. And if I had just been real about what I knew, what little I knew about farming and ranching at the time, I think it, it would have been far better. And eventually we were able to communicate that and work that out, but um, it, it took some time and, and just sharing and communicating was really important. Yeah, I, a couple of things that I just wanna to add to that. I do think we model how we handle stress and how we handle our, our reactions to things. We model that for our kids. And so when things don't go our way, they watch to see how we react. And if we can show them that this is not what we wanted, but we can deal with it and we can still work toward finding some solutions, you're modeling that for your kids. And that is a gift I think that is, it's priceless. The other thing that I think children are natural learners and they are naturally inquisitive. Children, if you've ever been around them, you know that they're constantly asking questions. They wanna know how things work. And so I think it's been a huge asset for us to be able to raise kids on this ranch because the questions that they ask helps us shift our own paradigms. So, you know, yeah, why, why are we doing this? And, and why is that animal behaving that way? And why are our soils looking like this? And 
kids noticing those kinds of things, I mean, they tend to be fascinated with nature and they tend to be fascinated with watching things grow and, and seeing things um, just, yeah, progress. So I, I think that if we just capture kids' natural ability to learn and their fascination with nature, I think a ranch is one of, I'm just so thankful that we have an opportunity to have our kids here. And we try to invite <laughs> the city and the town kids out to our place so they can experience it as well because they have great questions and and it's been helpful for us so I think that mutual beneficial um, mutually beneficial relationship of however many generations you have in your operation take advantage of that there's things that the the grandparents can do and, and can teach and maybe the time that they have that the, the parent generation doesn't necessarily have we try to maximize our relationship here in our operation so we want our kids to be connected with their grandparents there's things that they can teach them that josh and i can't and there's things that you know that are that his parents enjoy and my parents too but the grandparent generation enjoys of the grandkids so we've really worked hard to be to make it a mutually beneficial circumstance. Right. Um, this is kind of twist or changing the, the topic quite a bit, but um, I have a rancher friend that always seems to be down in the dumps and everything they talk about is negative. How do I balance between being there for them as a friend, but at the same time, keeping my own mental health moving in a positive direction? Yeah, I'll start with this one. So I do think that it is really good to set boundaries and understand that there is a line that should be drawn between where, where help can be offered and where it becomes burdensome on your own mental health. And so I think in, in that line is gonna be drawn a little bit differently for each different person in each different relationship. But I think it is very wise and healthy for the person who's on the more helping end to, to set some kind of a boundary and check in on that person, definitely offer encouragement. But like Joshua brought up earlier, if, if people are, if, okay, so if, if I myself is expecting other people to fill my bucket, I need encourage, I mean, constant encouragement for other people to fill my bucket you know, some one person can say the wrong thing and then like that whole bucket just gets emptied. So, I mean, that person ultimately should be referred on to some additional help. And, you know, we love it when people reach out to us and here's why. We don't always have the answer and we're not always like the end person, but when people reach out to us, we're usually able to, because people have shared resources with us and they've been phenomenal. We like to then get person, whoever whoever comes to us we like to get them connected to the next person that would be of of help and so maybe that person really truly needs some kind of mental health therapy or some you know emotional health therapy maybe you know they need some some physical kind of encouragement i mean it really depends on what that person needs but for the the friend who wants to be there for their friend i think be there to the level that does not become burdensome for you um recommend something. I mean, you can even, like I said, bring them to us and then we'll get them connected to the next person um, and, and pray. I think the biggest thing that we can do is pray over that person and pray for guidance that, that you give advice that's helpful and beneficial. So they ultimately get the true help that they need so that you're actually seeking solutions for that person, not just masking symptoms by allowing that person to continue to complain and walk and complain and whine and complain and whine and complain and whine. They're not helping themselves and they're not helping you. I think it's important too, to understand the context of the situation. Is it a, is it a, an acute type thing or is it a chronic type thing? Uh, if it's a chronic type thing, I think these boundaries are really important uh, because then we're also probably should be asking the question, you know, what can I do to empower this person? But where, where am I possibly enabling this person? And, and I think that becomes a question that needs to be asked so you can determine how to use your time. Obviously, if someone is in a situation where they're down in the dumps because of something very specific that happened or maybe just happened recently and therefore it's an acute type situation, then I think that's a little different. And, and you to, to be able to be there for them and to support them and help them, uh, I, I think most all of us would, would do.
long time and this is doesn't change and they don't seem uh, committed, they don't seem interested, let alone committed in making changes, then, I mean, you still want to be a, a good friend and be supportive and, and maybe a good listener. Uh, but at some point you need to, to make sure you protect yourself as well, because you have other people that are probably, excuse me, relying on you and, and, and need your, your time and your energy, uh, including just yourself and your ability to, to think and to process. Um, the next question is kind of on a different topic. Um, there are improvements that we'd like to make uh, to our ranch, but we don't know where to start. Our budget doesn't allow for us to just go and install all of those practices on our own. What would you recommend and where would you start? <clears throat> well, I think it's, it's, it's good to, first of all, understand where your financial situation is. I've seen, I've seen some operations where they got so gung-ho about these different practices, whether it's grazing management or it's cropping or, or, or whatever, whatever, conservation or regenerative ag practice it might be and and they just went in and just all at once and, and did some things uh put in some infrastructure and maybe weren't ready for the learning curve that came with it or maybe couldn't handle it financially or maybe didn't do it in an order that was appropriate and so they ran into a little bit of trouble that way so taking a, a step back and doing some analysis about where is the weakest link in all of this because on most of our operations, we probably have big dreams about what we want this place to look like five, 10, 20 years down the road. But we also know that we're not gonna just jump 20 years down the road in one or two years with a whole bunch of, of infrastructure, enterprises, et cetera. Sometimes the best way, and at least it has been for us, the best way to get a handle on where our situation is and what the weakest link might be or what the first step might be, is to have someone else come and look at it with us. And like, as in a mentor uh, type scenario, because this is this is a scenario where we've probably stared at it a whole bunch for, for quite some time. And we might not be able to pick out of our whole situation exactly where, uh, where we should start, or we might just be feeling overwhelmed. And as Tara talked about earlier, then we're, we're actually in an emotional state that's not helping us think logically and rationally about what a step one, step two, step three uh, should be. So we need to sort that out first, and then we may need some facilitation or some extra help or another set of eyes uh, on that process uh, to be able to do that. Because in most scenarios, there is a logical and rational way of, of okay, here's step one, we're going to do that first. Once that's done, then we can actually implement maybe steps two and three together at, at the same time. And all the while we can handle the learning curve uh, that comes with it. Yeah, and everybody does that at their own pace. You have some that will dive in and do absolutely everything at one time. And then you have the next one that's very hesitant about things. And I guess I, uh, I just love what Jay Fear has preached for a long time and that's one field at a time. And I look at that the same with grazing systems and it's one pasture at a time, one fence at a time. You know whatever that might be and, and just make sure that you are that you're comfortable with you know how you're going about doing that and and there are plenty of resources out there um you know through multiple organizations agencies that are available for you know the financial assistance and um are more than willing to to work with the ranchers and um put these practices on the ground so it's it's well, nice to have them as partners Absolutely. And, and there was a piece of advice I was given several years ago after, after seeing several different operations. And these operations had four, five, six, seven different enterprises. And of course, they had taken some time to get to that point. But these operations were operating, in, at least in my opinion, at a high level. They had multiple generations, multiple people involved. And I looked at that and I was simultaneously as excited as I had been about agriculture in a long time and defeated at the same time. And I asked the question, I said, how do I even do this? Where do I start? How do I get to, how do I do all this? And that mentor told me, he said, you don't. And I, I was confused at first. I'm like, what do you mean? You, I, here, I'm so excited. And you tell me not to do this. He said, no, Josh. He's like, you will burn yourself out and you won't be able to. And he said, I don't know. He said, maybe you got lots of money, but he said, you might burn yourself out financially in the process as well, if not mentally and emotionally. And he said, you find what your centerpiece enterprise is going to be. Or if you have an existing scenario, you find out what's working well first 
and you make sure that you're solid on those. And then you start maybe pulling the pieces away that are not working well uh, or changing them so they can work well. And you just take it layer by layer in the process and you don't try and do everything at once. Don't look at someone else's ranch and say, that's exactly what I'm gonna do. And the quicker I can get there, the better because that could honestly be a recipe for disaster, even if it's working well for that other place. Great. Um, well, I'm gonna ask one more question then I'll kind of touch base with you guys and see where we're at as far as time and, and how much more you wanna go. But this one here is kind of applicable to the, the environmental conditions that we're facing right now. Um, if the drought we are experiencing continues, uh, what are your recommendations moving forward to help eliminate extra stress? <clears throat> Well, hopefully it just starts raining and then and then we can not have to talk about that so much. But I, but I do think that there's some opportunity uh, in in our current environmental conditions with with this drought. Um, and of course, the, the the first thing, if you if you've heard the, the the statement about when's the best time to plant a tree, well, it was 20 years ago, but the next best time is, of course, today. Uh, the same is kind of with the situation with drought, you know, the time to be planning for drought and to put into place what you're, what you're looking for, what your, what your thresholds are for making certain decisions, and then what those decisions are going to be, uh, that, first of all, probably should have been done months ago and done in a scenario or under a scenario where you were not stressed about drought already. You were thinking logically, rationally, uh, you're able to put those plans together to where when drought does happen, and, and it will, uh, but you have this plan in place to where now you just have to execute. And, and I'll be honest, I, I see his name up here, so I, he must be, must be listening, but, but Mr. Chad Nays, he's, he's one of the first ones that I heard that from years ago. And I, I was actually teaching the financial school, uh, but I had Chad and Amanda come in and speak. And one of the things that I think, well, it really caught my attention, but I was able to, to watch the, the audiences, the rest of the attendees as well, is when he talked about, he said, my drought plan was in place months ago. He said, so when we got to actual drought, which we know could happen, I just crossed one bridge at a time, executing the steps that we had outlined and adjusting as we needed to. And if I remember right, he, he said, you know, it's honestly one of the easiest droughts that I've ever been through. And for someone to use the term, and, 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 I'm, and, and it's not that it wasn't still hard. It's not that drought isn't dynamic and, and complex and it's, it can be hurtful and all those things, but we do everything we can in order to put ourselves in the best position possible to be successful, even in a drought. And what he outlined that day, uh, I thought really summed that, that up well. And, and that's the process that, that I know we have tried to adopt and, and others have, well, have as well. So the first step is if you can do that, even if it means you're gonna do this now for next year, uh, do, you know, make sure you do that. But if you're in a situation now where droughts upon us, you're starting to get stressed about it, maybe that's to a fairly high level already, we need to be honest with ourselves that this is stressful. That's okay to, to have some stress, but now who are we gonna lean on? Not who are we gonna blame or who are we gonna find at fault, but who are we gonna lean on? Who are our mentors? Who is our resource network? Who are we gonna ask questions of? You know, I, I know we keep referring back to the Grazing Coalition and the mentor list, but there are people that have not only been there, done that, but they've been there, done that for like 20 plus years. And so those resources are going to be invaluable in order to be able to step through any given scenario where people are at and what their maybe their first step can be, what their second step can be. And I know for me, if I had to take on so many of the challenges that we've seen, you know, by myself with no input and no second opinion, that would have been that much harder. But knowing that I had someone I could call or, or three or four people that I could call. Um, and, 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 and one last piece about that that I wanted to say is, you know, some people are very hesitant to call and pester someone. They think they're being a burden to them. Right. And I had a mentor tell me just probably about two years ago when I told him, I said, well, I'm gonna try and limit how many times I call you per month because I'm afraid that I'm taking up too much of your time. And he's like, well, I'll be very disappointed if you don't call. Now, yes, we're all busy, but I told him, I said, but I have no idea how I'm ever going to pay you back for what you are sharing with me. And he said, no, you won't ever be able to pay me back. And he said, that's not even the point. He said, this is a pay mentorship is a pay it forward type of concept. 
He said, I am paying it forward to you because someone paid it forward to me once upon a time. And he said, your only job within this is that you are going to pay it forward to someone else down the road. You don't look back to pay it back to someone. You pay it forward to the next person. And that gave me a lot of peace knowing that at some point in time, and, and maybe even hopefully currently, um, I can serve people in that capacity because others have really served us in that capacity first. And I just want to add, it, it takes the same amount of time to make those kind of phone calls, like the mentorship kind of phone calls, as it does to make the phone calls of commiseration. It takes the same amount of time. And yet the outcome is going to be completely different. So taking the time, whereas instead of we kind of go to complaining about our circumstances or commiserating with other people about how bad it is, how dry it is, how awful it is, we can take that energy and just rechannel it into, into these kind of mentorship things. Because ultimately, I mean, it is what it is. So we can either complain or we can do something about it. Right. It's very ironic that you uh, brought Chad's name up because I was sitting here thinking the same exact thing, you know. Donnie and I here a couple of months ago, we were like, okay, the plan is in place. We may have to fine tune it. We may have to adjust a few things here and there. But I remember sitting in that class and exactly what, you know, he had said. And, you know, we, we were able to ride through things, you know, and, and we were still okay after we came out the other side of, of the drought for that year. And uh, so anyway, um, are you, where are you guys at for time? Do you want more questions? I, I still have more, but it's up to you guys. We can take a couple more. Okay. Um, let me see here. Um, here's one that it's kind of a different topic we haven't brought up. Um, we're considering a new enterprise on our ranch. My husband wants to go uh, full on with it. I'm more apprehensive about starting something else. What would you recommend as our next step in our decision making process? a very open, genuine, honest conversation about why one wants to move forward full speed ahead and why one is hesitant to, to do it. And I, I would take a stab at, um, they're probably making some assumptions on each other's behalf about why they want to do it. And they might be correct, uh, but they also might not have the full story as to why uh, one individual is hesitant and why one individual is just, you know, full throttle. And, and someone might, for example, someone might say, hey, if this enterprise is gonna bring us in some, some more money, and right now the money situation's not great on our ranch, the sooner we get up to speed and go, the sooner it is. Uh, while on the other side of it, someone might say, hey, we are so stretched thin right now, we can't hardly get the things done that we have on our plate, and our family life is maybe not the way that we would like it, we can't ever get away, why do we wanna add one more thing? Well, this is a scenario where that honest, genuine conversation needs to take place. And maybe there's a way to design this new enterprise, or maybe it's a different enterprise that actually can accommodate both of the concerns that, that, are, that are taking place uh, in, that, in that scenario. Uh, but to just add, more one, add one more thing to their plate, uh, or to just assume that this might you know, fix our financial situation, um, that, that's not deep enough, and, and that's not enough analysis to, to really come out with a good chance of success. It's one of the things that I love having, one of the reasons I love having a holistic context created is because when these opportunities come up or challenges, or in this case, a new enterprise, we can refer back to the holistic context that we created together and we can say, okay, does this help us? Does this move us toward our quality of life goals or does it move us away from? And, and again, you're still gonna have to ask a lot of these questions that Josh mentioned, but having that kind of context where you have a, you know, an identified vision and a shared common vision between the husband and wife, between the family, between the operation, it, it kind of puts some parameters on some things so that it makes some of those questions a little bit easier to ask and a little bit easier to answer. They either meet your goals or they don't. And it might not be entirely black and white, but it serves as a really strong reference point that hopefully that 
holistic context was created at a time when people weren't highly emotional. Mm -hmm. They were able to take some time to really get down on paper what's important to them and how they want things to be to where you can carry then that, that piece of information, that reference point, you can carry that into some pretty tumultuous situations, some pretty stressful situations, and you constantly have that to look back on because you know when you created it, you were in a place uh, that, that, that you were good. And therefore, when these come up, some things might eliminate themselves pretty quick. Other things might show a lot of promise. Yeah. And we are big on accommodation. You know, there might be something with the enterprise that might just, yeah, you tweak it enough so that it accommodates what one spouse wants and what the other one was concerned wants. about. Yeah. Great. This might kind of be an add on question to this. Um, it's how can I get my partner to open up and work together? Well, I, really, it's going to depend on the couple. And I, I do think, again, we love having a context because it allows spouses to talk about what their goals are and what their long-term vision is, just so that you can get on the same page. Um, do you have something... Well, I was just going to add that as far as that context goes, it, it might be some are able to to maybe set that and, and identify it and get it down on paper themselves. Some, like in our situation, we needed a facilitator to be able to do that. And, and the reason I bring that up is from the standpoint that in our case, it was it was four people, uh, my parents included, that were a part of that. And as we've mentioned in other presentations, we have some members of, of this team that are very verbal and very vocal. And there's others that tend to keep to themselves more. And it's not unless we had that facilitator that, that he was able to draw stuff out of some uh, while, while you know, keeping everybody balanced in terms of their contributions to that conversation. But when those things started pouring out of the people that didn't typically contribute a lot vocally, then all of a sudden we found out where people were at and what they wanted and what they desired. And, and when we did that, then all of a sudden we understood each other better. We understood what drives this person versus what drives this person. What's what this individual is passionate about versus what someone else is passionate about. And once we learned more about those things, now this idea of, well, how do I get that person to open up? Well, understand what makes them tick. And it took someone else on the outside to facilitate the conversation to start bringing that stuff out. And it was the context process that actually was basically just the format uh, in order for that conversation to, to occur. And therefore, then the questions that you can ask respectfully of each other to try and engage in those conversations to open up, as the question stated, um, it becomes more realistic that that can actually happen. And it might happen slowly, it might happen in stages, uh, but it's more important what direction we're going with that conversation uh, and, and that there's actually movement rather than just stagnation. What was the, that question again, Trish? Um, how do I get my partner to open up and work together? Yeah, I think making sure too, just to add on to what Josh said, really creating some safe space so that it's not confrontational. Uh, there, there is a method of decision-making and we touch on it in some of our holistic management schools, depending on how much time we have, um, but it's called the Edward de, bon it's Edward de Bono. And it's the six thinking hats. You can, there's a book on it, there's trainings, there's webinars, there's, there's lots of different resources and you can use that method a lot of different ways. But essentially what it does is it, it assigns a color that represents different facilitation tools and a process. And so I'd highly recommend that process. Um, we probably don't have time to explain the whole thing now, but the gist of it is blue represents facilitation, white represents the facts. Green represents the brainstorming. Yellow represents the, the pros or the advantages or the benefits of any given scenario. Black represents the disadvantages, the negatives, the cons. And then um, red, red is the emotional piece. Mm -hmm. And we love having, between the two of us, we love having common language for things. And when we have something that, that, that we have meaning to, the red, being emotion, like we've talked about before, sometimes there's 
the barriers come up in communication when one person gets too emotional or the conversation becomes too emotional. And so, you know, whether it's tempers that flare up or feelings get hurt or whatever that is, I mean, these are really big things and it can happen in, in communication and relationships between marriages, between different generations, parents and children. I mean, it's huge. And so being able to say something like, oh, there's some red hat here. We're having a conversation. All of a sudden it's gotten emotional. It's much easier and well-received to say, I'm recognizing red hat. I think we need to stop this communication right now. Take a break. You can always come back to it later, but to use the phrase, I'm calling red hat provokes a lot less defensiveness than does, you know, you calling out someone else and telling them that they're being something like irrational or you've lost your temper or, you know, some of those things that can kind of create that defensive reaction. So having, I would really recommend looking that kind of strategy, that method up, um, because it, it, it gives some language that can be commonly used. Um, again, I know there's some, I've had some great conversations with Annie who's listening too. She says that she, in their relationship, she tends to wear the yellow hat and her husband tends to wear the black hat. And in a way that's great because they can balance each other out. But I think it's really good to stretch ourselves to have both of us looking at yellow hat together and both of us looking at the black hat together and both of us brainstorming together and just having that kind of you know freedom in your conversations. Um, so yeah, I would recommend that as, as being a really good starting point for, for couples and for families to have better facilitated conversations, something that you can do on your own. You touched on this just a little bit, but I had a question that came in on um, Facebook Live that I, I really wanna ask you guys. Um, how do I encourage my spouse to give input on farm and ranch business or new farm enterprise? My wife is a big city girl and feels inadequate to give opinion. Well, I, I can comment first and then Tara can correct me, I suppose. Um, <laughs> but, you know, when, when we first, it, it's a little bit of our scenario uh, to a certain extent, Tara, not, you know, growing up on a farm and a ranch. And of course, now we're moved back to the farm and ranch that I did grow up on. And when we first started doing things here, I mean, I just hit the ground running when we moved. And probably the hardest questions that she asked up front or, or initially were, why? Why, why do you do this? Why do you do that? And, and to tell you the truth, I didn't handle those particularly well early on. Uh, I was I was just sprinting from here to there and off off to the next thing. And what, what do you mean? Why? Well, this is this is what we do. And and I, and I even honestly, genuinely thought, well, this is not how we did it, you know, necessarily when I was a kid. This is what I learned from my mentors and from working at the soil conservation and being a part of the grazing coalition. So I thought, why, why should I have to explain myself? But long story short, her asking those why questions have shifted from being something that I thought was just taking up my time to being the very effective, powerful, um, and, and they were genuine. They, they weren't asked in, in sarcasm or those, it was like, I would like to know. I'm asking why because I don't know. I, I, I haven't been there, I haven't done that. And it was those questions that I couldn't ask, or excuse me, I couldn't answer that I really struggled with. And I needed to struggle with those. And some of those have facilitated change on our place. So the role that that she has has played, and of course, you know, you 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 know Tara, she hasn't yeah, been I, bashful. I but, always share my opinion. <laughs> but but now there's things that I ask for her opinion that I didn't ask for before because she's gonna her value. Uh, is a multitude of ways, but one of those ways is being able to come at it still kind of from an outside looking in perspective and from a, a, a standpoint of, of uh, not the same normal and usual, not how I grew up, those sorts of things. So there's a lot of value in having that type of um, question asking ability and that type of perspective right in your own home. I want to go back to the question, Trish, for clarification, it was in this case, the husband wanted the wife's opinion, but the wife doesn't tend to, to want to share. Yes, it was how do I encourage my spouse to give input on farmer ranch business or new farm enterprises? The wife is a big city girl and feels inadequate to give her opinion. Yeah, I think just offer encouragement, make sure that you're letting her know that you do value her opinion. 
And there is, I know that if she's struggling with not thinking that she's credible to give her opinion, I would say the opposite. Oftentimes, like Josh mentioned, an outside perspective can actually ask some, you know, bigger questions than, than somebody who's just been doing this their whole life. And you don't really think twice about what you're doing or why you're doing it. So again, if he's very, very clear and intentional about saying, I value your opinion and you can offer insight as an outside perspective. And like, you might have to pay for that, you know, so she can offer it for, for free. So she's got, you know, skin in the game, but at the same time, she's seeing it with a, with a very different set of, of perception. I also think that just understanding the the reality of the situation is that's also something that that she probably is going to grow into. It's not going to be, hey, we're here at the farm now. Now we're going to, you know, operate as if we've been here for 20 years. Um, it, it's just one of those things that, like Tara said, you offer encouragement, you start building, um, you know, how that's going to look in those in, in your operation, and it'll look different than maybe a different operation. And I know Tara had brought this up, I think, in our other um, the other virtual series was was just trying to figure out what her role was and what her place was and where she could start working on developing something that was going to be in her leadership wheelhouse. And that all took time to, to do. And so I think just understanding expectations, just asking for an opinion, I think is good right off the bat and, and, and paying compliments and, and, and just talking about how valuable that opinion is, I think right off the bat is good, but it will come in time as well as she's included, as uh, she gets to be involved. And as this isn't a, um, you know, a completely separate deal. We've seen a lot of operations and there's nothing wrong with this if this is good with both uh, individuals, both spouses. Some it's, 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 he does his thing and she does her thing and they are good with that. There are others that that's not, they, they want to be side by side on a regular basis or they wanna have their specific roles and some things are together and some things are separate. So just needing to find what that right balance and ratio of things is in any given relationship, I think is, is important to understand. And, and that can be built and understood better through the context development. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a whole lot of, I'd love to sit down and have dinner with this couple because I think there's a lot of other questions that probably come, would would factor in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what what is her current level of involvement? Does she want to be more involved but just doesn't know how? Or does she honestly not want to be involved but he wants her to be involved? You know, so there's just one question is going to keep leading to other questions. And I think what we really love about our holistic management schools is we tend to do three day schools. And we started um, it just, we kind of did this and now it's become our tradition that the, the evening of the second night, we invite everyone to come out to dinner with us. And people can invite, you know, it's everyone on their own, but people can invite other people. So like, if one person is taking the school with us, they can invite their spouse or their neighbors or their friends, anybody. I mean, it's, we all just meet and we share a meal together and we have some of these really great conversations and we can all kind of talk about some commonalities. And, and it's not because we have all the answers. It's just that there's lots of other people there that have walked similar roads or have navigated similar paths or who, you know, can I, I can't identify with somebody who does not freely give their opinion, but there's somebody else, you know, who probably can speak better to that. And so we, we really love that. And sometimes even when we have the opportunity, we try to share um, all of our evening meals together. And it's just so nice to be connected and have those kinds of conversations with other people. Yeah. And I think allowing them to find you know, their niche in the operation. It may not be going out and rolling out electric fence and it might not be, you know, helping work the cattle one day, but it might be marketing something that needs to be marketed or it might be providing an educational experience, you know, at your operation or, you know, doing a, a kid's day or, I mean, there's just so many different things that I, I think it's, it's a matter of, you know, asking their thoughts, asking their opinions, um, getting their feedback and, and over time, they those they they meld together, I guess, and they mesh together. They just have to find the where that exactly works, and and to find that commonality. So yeah, 
I mean, I really can, re I felt extremely intimidated moving when we moved out here because I did not understand my role and I didn't, I wanted to be helpful and I was capable of doing things, but I didn't know what those things were. And so it, it definitely was something that was a tough thing that we had to navigate, but we're better off for it. I mean, those struggles, struggles can pay off. I mean, I think we can all, a lot of us, we can look back at times in our life when we've struggled and we can see how how much we grow experiences. And so I think that's a big thing that, you know, maybe as we, we close this topic, you know, this whole thing was about navigating the tough stuff. And if you're in a tough thing right now, whether it's drought or whether it's a communication barrier with a, a spouse or a, a different generation within your operation, I mean, just know that this struggle that you're going through, God can use it. And you can, you can bloom where you're being planted and you can definitely grow from this. Now, I mean, again, we can't say it and suggest it strongly enough. Stay connected, reach out to people for help, find a mentor. And again, get connected to, to us or to the Grazing Lands Coalition. Cause if we don't know, we'll put you in touch with a mentor who, who might be able to point you in a better direction, but you're never, ever, ever alone in what you're going through. Right. Well, I think that is a good place for us to end tonight. Um, unless you guys want to, do you have any other closing comments that you'd like to make? You know, just that we've, we've appreciated, I mean, that this avenue is available to, to share information. I mean, not just for us to speak, but for us to, to learn. And, and we're appreciative that the Grazing Coalition uh, did this and, and then re up a second time uh, here in, in uh, April. Uh, to, to do this as, as well. Um, we'd love to hear from people. Uh, go to our website. Um, we've got some schools coming up if, if people are interested or if you think it'd be a good opportunity to uh, uh, bring those other people in your family or operations so they can hear other people and, and yet connect with, with other people that like Tara said are maybe going through some of the same things. Um, and we would love the opportunity to, to help facilitate that process. Yep, I agree. And I just did uh, do some updating on our website. So I have revamped kind of the, we have a new resources page that's specific to resources. Uh, Grazing Lands Coalition is on there. The whole Munch on This series is, is on there. And I'll continue to add to that um, because we believe that knowledge and wisdom is meant to be shared and people uh, do best when they're connected to to things that are helpful for them. So yes, yeah, so we've got on seekfirstranch.com, we've got a section for resources and then the upcoming events. So lots of well, exciting things happening. Yeah, I, I really appreciate you guys being on this evening. Um, I would highly encourage anybody, uh, whether you are a rancher, a farmer, whether you don't even farm and ranch to take a holistic management class because there are so many beneficial um, aspects to, to those classes. So um, even if you're a city girl. Yes, even if you're a city girl. And I strongly recommend that you go as a couple, as a family, as a, you know, an, an operation, um, it, you just get so much more benefit out of it. Um, if you can commit those days together to go and learn together. Um, you know, that's a good point, Trish. You know what? I'd like to add, if you don't mind. No, go ahead. The, with, with our holistic management schools, we really had, um, Joshua and I've had a lot of conversations about what the next step is for the holistic management schools, because we, we kind of had them divided up into you take the intro school and then you'd go on to the more advanced schools. And what we really have realized is that holistic management works the best when people are on the same page and they have a common vision and they have the common language. And so we've really kind of restructured our holistic management schools to where it invites people to continue to come back but to come back with the next person. So if you've taken it on your own before, come back and take it with your spouse. It's gonna be new and different every single time. I mean, the structure of it is gonna be the same, but we're gonna have, it's always gonna be a different experience because there's different conversations that we'll have. Um, so if you've gone before, come back with your spouse. Come back the next time with your father or your father-in-law or your mother, or your mother-in-law or with your kids. 
come back with your neighbors, just invite other people. And so we really are, we, we have this new kind of goal of continuing on with this community mindset. So if you've taken a holistic management school before, if you are already practicing holistic management, the schools are still for you. They're for you to bring along other people so that you can all get on the same page. Let us help navigate some of the conversations to help you, you know, some of the questions that we had tonight, you know, how do I convince my dad and how do I get more opinions from my wife and how do, how do we bring up kids? You know, um, there was, we actually just did a school in February in South Dakota and we had children participating in the school. They, they participated and they were actively involved with it. There were some, yeah, some like elementary, upper elementary school age and high school age kids. And it just, that was phenomenal. It was That's great. Awesome. So we just thought, well, why aren't, why aren't we doing this? Why aren't we raising up kids to be able to ask these questions and put things in, in context. So that's kind of where we're moving with this holistic management is continuing to bring more people on board, get your older generation there, get your younger generation there. This it's for everybody. Yeah. And I can vouch for that because I took the first class that I ever took was myself just out of college with Wayne Berry. And then after Donnie and I were married, we attended the class with you guys and you just get something completely different out of it each time. And so I, I totally understand where you're coming from and it probably spurs us to even think about coming back to another one, because I think you can always refresh your memory and there's always something that's changing. So, um, bring your kids. Yes. And bring the kids too. I think that's awesome that, that the kids were involved and, and, uh, encouraged to be there. So um, well, with that, I am going to cover a couple of things. Uh, we have some events coming up that we've finally got dates set for. Um, they are in person, so this is great. We're, we're moving forward. Um, on June 24th, uh, the Grazing Lands Coalition will be hosting its summer tour, and that will be at Brad Sands at El Ellendale. Um, so more details will be coming out. There'll be a save the date uh, postcard being uh, being mailed out here fairly soon. The other event right now that we have on the calendar is the Leopold tour. Um, that is also a grazing tour in conjunction with the uh, Burley County SCD. And that is on August 19th. And that will be at the Dr. Jensen Ranch at Denhoff, North Dakota. Um, and I do think uh, Daryl had told me that um, we have a few, they, they lined up a few speakers, I think, to come into that as well. So. Um, more information will be coming out on that. Uh, the session tonight, as all with all the rest of them, have been recorded, and we will share that information on the Facebook page, YouTube channel, um, Grazing Lands Coalition website. Like I said earlier, if you have topics that you'd like to hear about um, next winter, um, please feel free to message me, email me, call, doesn't make any difference. Um, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, we've had a great response. Uh, as far as uh, people participating, um, people going back and asking for the recordings and, and wanting to go back and listen to them when they have free time. So it's, it's been a, a, great, uh, a great way to deal with a not perfect situation with, with COVID and things. So um, it's like I said, it gives you an opportunity to reach out to people that maybe otherwise wouldn't be able to travel and be at these events too. So, um, Without further ado, I think we will close off for the evening, and I want to thank everybody for participating with us and being with us, uh, not only tonight, but all of our other evenings, and uh, I want to thank Josh and Tara one more time for being with us. We appreciate your guys' knowledge and um, being able to share with everyone, so. Yeah, and thank you yeah, for the questions. You. Yeah, well, you guys have a good evening, and let's pray for plenty of moisture coming our direction, so. Okay, hey, have a good, good day.